Good to see you guys. What a joy. What an amazing experience. It is a bit surreal. Uh, anybody notice it's a bit surreal on the planet lately? Anything yeah. happening that it's all different? Rather unusual time we live in. Um, Bob, let's see here. If someone with an extra hand could just run up here, help me get settled. Morginsky, I love you. Good to see you. What a blessing. Beautiful worship today, dear. Just uh, put it here. Yes, that's right. And I love your dad, too. Her parents got saved on Father's Day at The Rock, I think, 16 years ago, as, as I remember. And that is very exciting. So happy anniversary to them. All right. I do want to do a little video just so I can remember being here. Um, sometimes I forget where I am from day to day, and I just want to remember that I was here. So I want you to pretend that you love me. <laughs> For some of you, it's a large stretch. Others, it shouldn't be that far. But I want you to just wave hello right now. Just say hello to me right there. There it is. I love you. Come on. Come on. Give me some. Give me some. Give me some. I love you. I love you. I look back over this. Come on, we love you. I think the non-shady people love me more, I'm not sure. The people over there in the courtyard love me most, I'm not sure. Anyway, thank you guys so much for that. It is uh, therapy for me later on, and I appreciate it. Uh, it is a joy to have my beautiful wife of 44 years with me today, Susie. I can't. I can't even imagine the amount of money I've saved on counseling just marrying Susie. It has been, I mean, honestly, I owe her a great deal. She is a great wife, mother, grandmother, and I love you, baby. Thank you for putting up with me. I am home a lot now, and so uh, it's a challenge for her. Just pray for her because I'm an inquisitive kind of guy, and I, I'm a twin, and so I'm used to asking a lot of questions. But she's put me in a room. Uh, in the back that I'm able to come out at different points. Uh, it has a safety lock on it that she's able to press a button from the kitchen and then allow me to come out. <laughs> but not that we've had any conversations about that, but just in case we do in the days ahead. Well, it's a joy, again, to be with you. Uh, I love Pastor Bob. I've not even seen Pastor Mark. Is he here today? My goodness, did he hear I was coming? Is that what happened? Gosh, anyway, it's a joy to be with you guys. I have a lot on my heart. I do pray for you uh, very much. I pray for you. I pray for the church. I pray for Pastor Brandon and, and his family. Pray for Pastor Bob and Mark, all the leaders who are here, what God is doing. Obviously, um, Jesus promised something, and uh, certainly he's been faithful to that promise. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. How many have found his promises are true? That's right. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And so the challenge is to get through the first part to experience the second part. And I believe personally, and uh, today I'm launching, uh, I, actually, as I walked in here, it's amazing how serendipitous this was. I've been working on getting francesanfuso.com up for a long time. But literally, as I walked into this property, it finally has cleared all the different things. And so it does say that my goal in life is to help you find the secret to loving your life. Uh, and that may sound like a paradox. You know, why would you love life? Well, if you love the author of life and you trust the author of life and you believe that God only does wondrous things and that everything will work for your good, then why shouldn't you be searching for why you should love your life? I know at times it's enigmatic, it's hidden, it's mysterious, but it is there. So I invite you to go on there, and I've got messages and podcasts and lots of different things. You know, I believe it's important for us to know the season we are in. Um, I believe we are called prophetically to be spiritual meteorologists to determine what's going on so we can prepare. And, and I believe and I'm probably not saying something prophetic because it seems rather obvious that we are in a challenging season as a culture, as a nation, as a planet, and that only will escalate. You can give me a hand right now. That's a blessing if you want to hear that. All right, very good. So 
I believe the challenges of today are preludes to the challenges of tomorrow, but the muscles that we build up today will help us to face the challenges of tomorrow. And they're coming, they are real. Uh, and so I want to be able to grow to become the man, the person God has called me to be. I want to be growing all the days of my life. I want to be growing to face the situations that God has ordained, the Bible says, since the foundation of the world for me to face, to make me the person he's called me to be. So I want to talk to you about that today a little bit. Uh, I believe it is important to know that. I'm going to talk about how to have peace in chaos. When a country is in chaos, it says in Proverbs, everybody has a plan to fix it, but it takes a leader of real understanding to straighten things out. And so the only leader that has real understanding, who really knows past, present, and future, is God. And so he's the only leader that can lead us at this point. I understand we put momentary confidence in leaders to help us, and they may do their best. But unless that leader is tapped into the leader with a big L, then ultimately we're going to be very disappointed. So I am following really one leader. I'm living for an audience of one. Second person is Susie. But Jesus is always above Susie uh, in that order. But I do believe all of us need to understand at this point he knows what's going on, and he's going to help us to see that. Now, with all that's happening, and I, I have a kind of a, a historical vested interest in some of the challenges of today. I'll go through it very briefly. But uh, I was born in the beginning, the first half of the last century, 1949. I just squeaked in so I could be able to say I was born in the first half of the last century. And uh, consequently, I grew up uh, in the 50s and 60s. And so when I was 14, uh, I was watching TV. At that point, they had three channels, uh, all black and white. And I remember seeing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, sharing at 14 years of age. And it so impacted me. I remember just crying all weekend as we watched. My father was an immigrant from Sicily. And consequently, he knew about prejudice. Uh, when he was elected to Congress in 1950, the first thing he did was submit a bill against prejudice toward Italians, uh, which was passed. Um, I, I didn't know about that even until a few years ago. So in our home, there was not prejudice toward other ethnicities because we had experienced, we had walked a mile at least in that shoe, at least my father did uh, and my mother did in their lives. Uh, and so watching Dr. King, it began a relational connection to him. Uh, though I mentioned my father, I did not have a relationship with my dad. Uh, he was in Congress, as I just mentioned, a year after I was born. So he lived in Washington a lot, and I um, ultimately went to boarding school at 11 and never lived at home again. So when I'm watching uh, Dr. King, I'm actually visiting my parents in their home. And throughout the 60s, then growing up, continued to hear the resonation of Dr. King's wisdom, his insight, his understanding, his tone. And it was very different. My father, again, was a fatherless man. His dad died very early, so he was angry, frustrated, unhealthy, all kinds of issues. Not a faithful man. That's why my mother was with him all the time, just to keep the marriage together. And so when he died in 1968, Dr. King died. Uh, it was a big deal for me. He died in April. Uh, Bobby Kennedy, the senator, died in June. Very tumultuous time. If you could imagine multiple assassinations happening. By uh, the end of June, I was living with African-American young people uh, in a university uh, government program called Upward Bound and spent the next two summers, two out of three summers, living uh, primarily with African-American young men. And so when the riots were happening in Newark, I was hugging on to them, begging them to not leave, stay there. It's crazy. We were in northern New Jersey. That's where our um, university was. So I have history in that relational connection, and I really realized that Dr. King was a father figure for me. Uh, I don't even have a second leader in my childhood. He, he literally was at the Mount Everest in a, a, a land that was filled with plains. There was nothing else. No one, I can't even imagine a secondary person. That's how influential he was to me. So with all that's happening now, especially as uh, the Lord opened the door beyond Roseville to move into Sacramento, an incredibly multiracial city, all of, a, all of a sudden, relationships took place 
crossed culturally with lots of folks who became very uh, dear friends and still are with me. And so part of the frustration I've had recently that I've had to identify, why am I frustrated? Initially, I wondered, do I have, do I have compassion fatigue? As I watched George Floyd and the situation there, my heart broke, of course, just ridiculously absurd, uh, as many things have been absurd over the years. But we've also had police and fire banquets here for many years. Uh, and so the dichotomy of that, I thought it was compassion fatigue, but it wasn't. It was an underlying frustration that two people I loved, two people I loved, and I'm a, a twin, I have twins, so equity is very important. My twin brother and I would divide cookies to the millimeter. I mean, we would divide cookies and we would make sure that we were not cheated. And so I grew up with that. And so with our daughters, I would always make sure they knew I love them equally, even to today. I love them equally. And so when I saw, in a sense, the polar realities of family of people I love and care about, the African-American community um, and those of color and the police department at loggerheads, I didn't understand what it was producing in me, but a deep sadness. And um, especially having seen kind of the bright moments of Dr. King throwing the ball magnificently, you know, his speech was so, and the things he wrote is so magnificent. And then wondering, gosh, 60 years later, are, I mean, <laughs> this will probably not reconcile itself in my lifetime. Uh, and, and yet at times, we saw breakthroughs here in Sacramento. Uh, Francis Chan, ever heard of Francis Chan? Francis Chan came to our city and he went to a conference. We had about eight, 900 people uh, at a beautiful African-American church downtown St. Paul's with Ephraim, uh, Dr. Ephraim Williams. And Francis Chan said, I've never seen anything like this. So we had reached kind of a magnificent um, moment and then to see the struggles going on. And I've done, when you go on, on our, my site, you'll see round tables we're having with leaders. The friendships are intact, but in a sense, we had made a Normandy landing, and we thought we were going inland, and now we're kind of bunkered down on the beach. And so whatever your challenge is in this hour, I, I empathize with that. I, I feel like I want to go forward. But one of the, the exhortations I would give us, the Bible says, don't be overcome with evil. And there's evil everywhere. If you ever want to see evil up close, just look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. You'll never know a bigger hypocrite than yourself. You'll never know personally. Okay, the more I know me. Have you, how many can remember the expression I've said here over the years? The more I know me, the less impressed I am. That's exactly right. The more I know me, the less impressed I am. Because if you're honest with yourself, can you be? Are you really enamored by how you've aced every decision in life? I look back, Francis, it's pretty flawless. Actions, deeds, relationships, everything has been pretty magnificent. No, I look at my life and I need a savior today. I need God today more than I ever have because this is, this is crazy in terms of life and I need to be dependent upon him. And so if we're seeing evil in the world and it manifests itself, the only cure for evil is good. Don't be overcome with evil but overcome evil with good. And so uh, a, a kind of reverse racism, okay, where kind of the abused becomes the abuser, the person that's been hurt becomes the hurter. How can we stop in our hearts a retaliation when God wants to be a, a restoration of relational connection? And that requires going low. It requires humbling ourselves. Uh, with people, and it requires one relationship at a time. I just, kind of my appeal for the message today is, if we build relationships, you know, I made a podcast yesterday with an African-American new buddy of mine for the last few months that we walk now every week together, and he, he and I share some things in common, both grew up in New York, he's a health coach, we go to the same church, Jesus Culture, and so we, we've gone through a number of things together. He's more healed than hurt. And I really needed someone more healed than hurt. I needed someone that could advance the ball with me, that we weren't going to be pointing fingers. We were going to be circumspectly looking in our own hearts at issues that God wants to solve. And so we, we made a, a message about the wounds of our fathers. My father wounds affected me. 
His father, raised in the South as an African American, was wounded. And so when he was at a conference with his father, Promise Keepers, years ago, when they had an African American minister preaching, talking about reconciliation, he noticed his father having difficulty reaching across the aisle to greet someone. And it was so funny because his dad had never communicated. And he, he said, Dad, in the car later, why was that difficult for you? And his dad said, you know, son, I just don't know if we can reconcile with, the, with other races. And I don't think I'm, I'm really ready for that. And so his dad could not carry that ball across the finish line. Again, a good attitude, but just stuck, just going, this is safe, and I'm going to stay safe. But now his son, when he heard that, he was about 30 at the time, he's 54 now, he said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go further. i got to go further. And so what I would say, guys, right now, uh, in our nation, in our world, in your life, where are you going further? Be careful. Don't watch a lot of the news. I mean, uh, you know, honestly, watch WWF wrestling. That'd be better. Just watch that, and you'll get all the testosterone you need just watching that. But just be careful how much you're influencing yourself with stuff. Have your convictions, but have a greater conviction to build the kingdom of God. It's not going to be solved by politics. It's not going to be solved by man. It's not going to be solved by man's laws. Okay? It's going to be solved by you hearing from God and doing two things, loving him and loving people. You know, people have come to me in the, in the mid-70s. We spent night after night till 3 in the morning studying eschatology. What was the end-time eschatology? And even now people are contacting me, Francis, what do you think? Is this the end time? This is the beginning of the end times? Yes, the be, the be, absolutely. This is the, the last days. It began in the first century. And it's been going on now for 2,000 years. And I debated, should I get married? Because it's, it seems like things are wrapping up. But Susie would have been an old maid right now. Had I not gotten married to her, she'd be sitting there. We had kids. We have grandkids. I'm staying alive and being healthy so I can dance at my grandkids' weddings. And none of them are engaged. They're eight years old to 13. We've got some time here. And so I've got to remain healthy to see them get old enough for me to be there. But I... I just want to encourage us in the middle of this season, what season are we in? We're in a season of developing one-on-one -on -one relationships. We're a season where Joseph was a fruitful branch who went over the wall. Again, did Joseph have any issues with his family members? I seem to remember there was a bit of a tension. Dropped in a pit to be a slave and then not knowing he would see them years later. Now, guys, if he hadn't worked through in some way in his own heart attitudinally about his brothers, then when he saw them, and again, there was a metamorphosis. It, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. I'm still adjusting. I'm still making mid-course corrections. But he was ready to go through the process of offering them life. And what did that produce? He saved not just that little family. He saved the entire nation of Israel. He saved the legacy that Jesus would come from. So your decisions are significant. I, you know, I did not know when I met Chief Daniel Hahn, the new pastor of Roseville 10 years ago, uh, that we would become friends and that he'd be here for a number of years. And trust me, him being raised in Sacramento in Oak Park, uh, he was not elated. Hey, Roseville, I've always wanted to live in Roseville. No, no, he wasn't thinking that. No African-American man is thinking, let's go to Roseville. It's a, it was a challenge for them. They heard all kinds of things about Roseville, but he came here and was a good man and a good leader and did well. And a friendship began uh, that then continues with him in Sacramento. And so today I sent him, if you want to look on my Facebook, you can see it. I commended him uh, on Father's Day for being a father of Sacramento who has led well. And then one of the interviews I did with him and other key leaders in the region in February, uh, he talked about how he had gone to other officers and gone through many hours of talking to them about African-American history, what they had gone through. And he said it was well received in the leadership of the police department. And yet right now there's a, a struggle there. You know, we have a very good friend who's a police officer down there. And I sent him uh, again and his wife uh, encouragements today because, you know, it's so sad that 
the vilification that comes on us. And again, I understand that. I was angry because of my father rejecting me, not being there for me. Uh, so when uh, I was leading, I was the vice president of the anti-war movement at our university. When I jumped through the dean's window to take over the dean's office, I've not done that in months, and sat in his chair, I was actually, you know, saying to my father who was dead, I reject your leadership in my life. And I left before security came. Out through the same window I came in as they were calling security. But I was making a statement. The hurt within me wanted to make a hurtful statement until I was so filled up with hurt and pain and dysfunction in my life. 49 years ago soon, with a dull pocket knife in my hand, I cried out to the God I didn't believe in, God help me. And so my appeal to us at this po point in our lives, this is a great opportunity for you. Thank you for the confirmation. I asked that train to go by at that moment just to confirm. When I said great opportunity, <laughs> amen. Great opportunity for you and I to believe that this is not a stumbling stone. This is a stepping stone. This is not a stumbling block. This is a doorway of opportunity for you and I to go to the next level. Uh, I, I, it's a waste of time to ask God to change your circumstance. It's also a waste of time to fixate your attention. If this would just happen on the planet, then I could live a fulfilled, blessed, happy life. You are literally on a dead end street. <laughs> where they have signs that say no, no throughways. Is that what it says in the street? You can't get out once you're in there. So leave the concept that somehow, um, if the world would just change, my life would be better. That to me is the the definition of absurdity. If I have a new perspective toward life, my life will be better. And, and I do believe that God, thank you very much, so much for that encouragement. God bless you. I paid an actor to come here today just to, at that moment, give me an amen. You, you know, guys, I face every day, the same, you know, every day, and my wife would know this, I don't wake up to low-hanging fruit, low-hanging hope or peace. I climb a tree with a machete in my teeth, and I have to carve it out. Amen. Next generation, just running toward Jesus. I carve it out every day. I've got to believe to see the goodness of the Lord. David said, I would have lost hope. You know, I would have lost hope. If I had not believed before I saw it, believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so I, I could deceive you today by saying it's going to get better. It's going to get easier. Everything's going to work out. Your candidate's going to win. You know, the laws are going to be passed. People are going to love each other. Everything's going to calm down. I do not believe that. I believe it's going to get more challenging. And you and I are going to have to face the reality that either Jesus is sufficient for us. Or I will face a life that will not be very enjoyable. I do believe, again, when Paul was in prison back shredded midnight at a moment when you'd say how could anyone respond well all of a sudden Paul goes hey Silas let's sing a song <sighs> and they began to rock out in that prison in absolute faith nothing had changed their circumstances looked bleak they were in pain there was nothing promising happening, but they began to worship God. All of a sudden, earthquake takes place, prison doors open, jailer comes in as they expected, not. Jailer comes in, gets saved, and his family. How does it happen? It happens if you know in advance the jailer is going to get saved. It happens when no matter what you're seeing, what you're feeling, you're going to begin to praise God and everything give thanks. Why? Why would I do that? For this is the will of God. Rejoice evermore. Some of the faces here today, I wish you had masks on right now because <laughs> I, I'm really enjoying this. I think this is Bible. The Bible. 
remember the Bible. So all I would say, guys, yeah, I train my soul every day. David said he quieted his soul as a weaned child. Shh, 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 Francis, quiet. He quieted his soul as a weaned child. I train my soul. This is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. I don't need any circumstances to change outside. Don't try and make things easier for me. I don't want that. I don't want things easier. Don't deceive me. I'm not asking for harder. Let me say, if I were to beg God to make it easier, would he do it? If I were to beg God to make it harder, would he do it? No, he's got another plan. He will move his plan. His plan will happen. He's not going to listen to my begging. He's just saying, Francis, will you trust me? No matter what you see, what you feel. And I have found, you know, in my youth, being a very emotional guy, which you may pick up on, I had real highs and real lows. And man, it was Mount Everest, Death Valley, Mount Everest, Death Valley. And it was not fun. And after a while, I began to say, you know what? I'm going to throw my back out here. So I better begin to trust the Lord. And all of a sudden, I was less enamored and excited and elated about the seeming mountains and less discouraged about the apparent valleys because I realized over time neither one of them had longevity. They were all moments in time. And all of a sudden I began to make my life. That's why in my website that's launched today, that's around the world, millions of people right now are plugging into that. Uh, that my website talks about the secret to loving your life. I think it's a shame for us to spend a day on the planet with the God of the universe who's the greatest script writer of all time, who writes adventure stories that all have happy endings if we'll trust him, to spend any amount of time saying, you know what, I wish my life was different. I wish my circumstances were different. Why don't I just say, Lord, I don't have to know what's going on. I don't have to, I, I've never banged on the cockpit of a plane door asking the pilot if he knows what he's doing. I'm trusting strangers all the time. Why don't I trust the God who has proven himself faithful? This is going to be an important moment right now for you. Please don't miss it. If you have found God has been faithful to you, would you give God a hand right now? <laughs> Too much. Don't break a sweat. The reality is videotape replay reveals he's been faithful to all of us. None of us have been shortchanged. Everything that has taken place or will ever take place, if we respond the way God intended, which is well, will work for our good, will make us the people he's called us to be. I'm excited about my future because he's excited about my future. I'm excited about your future because he's excited about your future. I don't care. You know, I remember as young Christians, we talked about, well, it doesn't appear that America is mentioned in the book of Revelation. I don't know where America is going to fit in the great tapestry of life. All I know is that the Bible talks about Christ followers in the book of Revelation who are willing to give their lives, if ne necessary, to represent Jesus well. And so whether I'm doing it physically one day, and I've already said, maybe some of you remember, if, if my head is chopped off and it's rolling across the floor, my face will be... Smiling. Thank you so much. Okay, so you can check that out in the red box in heaven. If ultimately I die, amen, sister, if I die, I want at that moment to be saying I'm about in a moment to go face the one I've believed in since my youth, and I'm going to trust him. I'm not just going to wait for a physical moment. He says, Paul said, I die daily. If you are crucified with Christ, set your affections uh, on things above. If you then be risen with Christ, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So I want to pray for you. I'm not sure how much time I have. It's 10 o'clock. I heard pumpkins happening at that moment. So let me pray for you. Cigar. It's actually a piece of wood. But um, let me pray for you. How many of you would say, let me, let me ask you this question. How many, you may not fully believe what I said today, but you want to. <laughs>
If you at least want to, or you fully believe what I said, would you stand up? It's going to take some effort. Let's stand up together. And I want us to pray. You know, I, I fight for my peace of mind every day. I, I fight to believe the, ble the best. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Uh, and whatsoever things are true and just and pure and lovely, think on these things. I, I focus my mind on believing that God is going to cause everything happening in my life and even in our families and our nation will work for our good if. There's always a conditional reality to it. There's always if. If I want to respond, well, I can. My response will set in motion a chain reaction. My response is a seed. Right now, your response is a seed, and that seed is saying, I believe to see. I believe the will of God more than what I feel, more than what I see. I really don't care as much what's happening outside of me. I really care what's happening inside of me. And I want to pray that for you. I'm not minimizing the challenge of life. I can have great empathy for that. We're all challenged. But I read in the book of Hezekiah. How many of you read the book of Hezekiah recently? Hezekiah 4, verse 3. It says, in a new translation, it says, Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> King James was, Sucketh upeth, buttercupeth. <laughs> Remember as a young man memorizing that verse, and it really did help me at different points. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. This I know God is for me because I am for him. One of the great verses of, in Joshua where the angel, Michael, was there in a battle. And, and one of the leaders came and said, whose side are you on? And he goes, I'm on God's side. I'm commander of the army of the Lord. So right now, as, as divisions are happening and people are having to choose which side am I on, I, let me just tell you, I'm on the winning team. <laughs> Only one team wins, and that's the kingdom of God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So may you find your heart, your attitude, your perspective that you're on his team. And that's all that matters, folks. Everything else is a distraction. Father, I pray, I love, I love, I love this church family. I love your people. So many of them have, mem I have memories with them. Moments where we could put down a plaque of a prayer we prayed or a hug we had and things we shared that were meaningful. But I love them, I bless them. I thank you, Lord, for this body of believers that has a future and a hope, Lord. I thank you that you know all things. And in heaven, the sign says everything is going exactly as planned. And because you know my future is bright, I'm excited about my future. I pray everyone here would be excited about the future, no matter what they're facing, how bleak it may look, how, may, how difficult it may seem. They may say, you know what, I'm excited about my future because God's excited about my future. I want you to pray with me this prayer out loud, please. Heavenly Father, I will not bow down to fear and unbelief. I want my heart to be soft. I'm going to trust you. No matter what I see, no matter what I feel, my future is bright because you wrote the script and I trust you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me, for conquering sin and death. You conquered the circumstances of your life in faith. I want to do the same. I trust you with my future. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Give God a hand.